Okay, well, I have a confession to make, and maybe it's your confession too, but as a kid, I never really remember the holiday of Shavuos, you know? I remember Pesach, I remember Hanukkah, and even though we didn't build a sukkah, I remember the sukkah at the shul, but Shavuos just seemed like a non-holiday. There was nothing to do on Shavuos. I don't think we even knew about cheesecake. So, you know, I called it the invisible holiday. Um... But it's interesting, you know, Pesach and Sukkot, which are the other two of the Shalosh Regalim, the big three, there's a lot of preparation, right? Pesach, we're cleaning our houses, we're getting rid of the chametz, we're getting, you know, we're, we're working hard, you know, before it and during it. And Sukkot, of course, everybody's busy banging away at a hut behind their house. But Shavuos, it seems like there's no real preparation at all, except to, you know, to make sure you got cheese in the house. However, when you really think about it, uh, Shavuos actually is the holiday that requires the most preparation because we actually get 49 days to prepare for Shavuos. But the reason it's overlooked is because it's an internal preparation, right? This whole time period, Pesach and Shavuos are the bookends of an of an incredible time period where we are counting the days towards the holiday of Shavuot, towards Man Matan Torah Tenu, the time of, of the giving of the Torah. But the whole time period in between, we are supposed to be refining our character traits, developing ourselves, making ourselves into someone who can be able to accept the Torah, making ourselves into a vessel because we know that ain derech eretz, ain Torah. If there's no derech eretz, meaning proper menschlichkeit, proper development, uh, working on oneself, then there is no Torah, as it says in the Mishnah. So we have a lot of preparation, actually, for Shavuos. So what I want to talk to you about today is the preparation of Shavuot that we actually learn from the Megillah that we read on Shavuot. On Shavuot, we read Megillat Ruth. And I have three questions about this. The first question is, why do we read this Megillah? Secondly, what is it about Ruth that merited that she would become the progenitor of King David? She was the great, the, the great grandmother of King David, who ultimately is the genealogy of where the Mashiach will come through. And lastly, what is it that we can learn practically from Ruth today so that we can really vamp up our, our preparations in the last six days ahead of us before uh, Shavuos comes and the receiving of the Torah begins? Okay, so the first question is, why do we read this McGill? And many, many reasons are given for it, but just a couple of them I want to mention. So the first very practical reason is that this uh, story takes place during the time between the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, which is exactly the time period that we're in. Ruth enters the story of the Jewish people at the time of the barley harvest. And basically at the end of the story, she marries Boaz. And that's the conclusion of the story. And of course, the beginning of the genealogy of King David. The second reason that we read Ruth, Ruth is because Ruth is the story of a convert par excellence. She is, you know, the poster child for a convert. And since we are all considered like converts on the day of Shavuos, we are all today, as they say, Hayom, we are accepting the Torah as if it was given to us this day. We are also to speak like converts, and Ruth is our role model of what we need to do, what we need to be, in order to be able to be Kabbalah the Torah. Also, interestingly, the word Ruth itself, the name Ruth in gematria and numerology equals 606. Now, every non-Jew before the Torah was given, and every person had already seven mitzvahs that we call the seven mitzvahs b'nai Noach. So the name Ruth connotes that she already had the seven mitzvahs, but she added the 606, which are the gematria of her name, the resh, vav, and taf, equals 606. Okay, 
Tough is 400, uh, Reish is 200, and the Vav is the six. The third reason that's given is that King David himself bo was born and died on Shavuot. And so we read this Megillah in order to know his genealogy, basically where he came from, and of course, ultimately, um, where the Mashiach will ultimately come from, which is, again, through Ruth. Okay, but why, what, what was it about Ruth that made her so special? Why was she so different than any other convert throughout history? And of course, we have many great converts in history. So the rabbis actually asked this question. They asked the question, why was the story of Ruth even included in our holy writings, in the Tanakh? What was so special about it? Why did we need this story? And they say, basically, the book of Ruth contains no laws regarding purity and impurity, nor laws of what is prohibited and what is permitted. So why was it written? And they answer in Ruth's Rabbah chapter 2, in order to teach the reward of those who do deeds of kindness. So there we have our answer. The reason that we read the Megillah of Ruth is because the idea of kindness, chesed, loving kindness, permeates the story. And Ruth is actually the personification, an epitome of what we call chesed. So Ruth merited to be part of the Jewish people. And more than that, to be the progenitor of King David because she embodied and personified the character trait of chesed. Think about it, even in the English language, when we wanna say somebody's cruel, we call them ruthless. They're ruthless. They're lacking Ruth, right? So it seems that her personality even came through into the English language. So what is chesed? What is chesed? What is loving kindness? And why is it so crucial for each one of us to develop this character trait as we head towards Shavuot with Ruth as our role model? So in Tehillim, King David himself wrote, Olam chesed yibane. This world is built on chesed. Hashem himself is constantly involved in sending blessing into his world for our benefit. In Pirkei Avos in chapter one, it tells us that the world stands on three things. Al shlosha devarim ha'olam omei. Al ha-Torah, al ha-Avodah, ve'al gemilut chasadim. The world stands like a tripod on three things, on Torah, on avoda, which is prayer, and on chesed. Basically, what this Mishnah is telling us is that without chesed, the world would literally fall apart. So who was Rus? And what did she do? Where do we see the chesed? And we're not going to go deeply into the story, but I'm just going to give you a few examples. So Rus was a Moabite princess. She was from the aristocracy of a place called Moab. And she leaves everything behind, her wealth, her, her status, to join the Jewish people. She comes back with Naomi after, having, after Naomi's husband has died and Naomi's sons have died. And Ruth, of course, is married to one of her sons. She comes back to Israel with Naomi, where she's going to be a nobody, where she will not only be a nobody, but despised and from the lowest level of society. But so great is Rus's desire to join the Jewish people that none of that matters to her. And throughout the Megillah, the Megillah tells us what Ruth, Ruth does for her mother-in-law, Naomi. For example, she does not allow her mother-in-law to go and glean in the fields. They are very impoverished. And Ruth takes it upon herself to take care of her mother's physical well-being. And throughout the story, we see that whatever Naomi asks Ruth to do, Ruth does it. And this subjugation that she has to Naomi's will is always for the sake of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And there are others in the story who also represent chesed. When Naomi sends Ruth to remind Boaz 
at the end of the story of his obligation to marry her and carry on the seed of her dead husband, Boaz says to Rus, you have made your latest act of kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after the young men. Many don't realize, but Boaz was an 80 year old man who had just lost his wife. And he had a responsibility through the laws of Yibum to perpetuate the seed of his kin, which was Rus's dead husband. And he steps up to the plate at the end of the story and the result of their marriage results in Yishai, who is the father of David HaMelech. Okay, so that's how it works. Now, let's talk a little bit more about chesed. What is chesed? What does it mean to be a person of chesed? So chesed means being other-oriented, looking outside yourself, seeing the other person, walking in their shoes, or as we say in Hebrew, being no say but all, carrying another person's burden. It's somebody who's always asking themselves, what can I do for you? How can I be of service? It's not about putting oneself last or being a shmata, right? Or not knowing one's worth, but rather it's about losing one's ego in service of the other. You know, it's again that line from that Joni Mitchell song, if any of you knew, like Joni Mitchell, she says, I love you when I forget about me. And I think that's a great short idea about what chesed does for us and what chesed is for the doer of chesed. In Hebrew, we see that the word love, ahava, and the word echad, again, they both equal 13. Because when there's love, which is giving, right? Giving is an expression of love. Then it, it, it creates a oneness between you and the one that you give to. And truly, this is what we're all here in this world for, to be there for the other and practice acts of kindness that change us into a kind person. I want to tell you a little bit about people who are experts at this. So I went on a site called um, storiestoinspire.com. It's a wonderful site with all kinds of headings. And I looked at a bunch of stories about people in our day and age who are masters at chesed. So the first story I want to tell you is about Rabbi Gifter. Rav Gifter was the Rosh Yeshiva of the Tel's Yeshiva in Cleveland, I think back in the 50s. Anyway, the story goes that uh, Rav Gifter was flying with his wife, the Rebetzin, from LaGuardia Airport to Cleveland. And there was a young yeshiva boy also who studied in Cleveland who was trying to get on the plane. He was uh, late uh, getting his ticket and he was hoping for standby. Anyway, it turns out that he ends up getting onto the plane and he's sitting in his seat when all of a sudden the stewardess comes over and says, here's your kosher meal. Yes, those were the days when we actually got food on the plane, <laughs> kosher meals, right? Anyway, this yeshiva bucker was shocked and he said, I, I, I didn't order a kosher meal and it's not, it can't be my meal because I, I just got on the plane. I just got on standby last minute. So the stewardess said, yes, we know it's not your meal, but the rabbi who's sitting up ahead, he told us to give you his meal. Oh, well, the boy said, no, 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 I can't take the Rosh Hashiva's meal. I'm not going to do that. I, I just can't do that. So, of course, he picks up his meal and he looks for Rabbi Gifter and he finds him and he says, Rosh Hashiva, please don't give me your meal. And Rabbi Gifter says to him, he says, listen, when I get home, no matter how late it is, it is my dear rabbit sitting next to me will make sure that I don't go to sleep hungry. He said, but when you get back to the yeshiva, the kitchen is definitely closed and you're going to be hungry. So please take my meal. So this is a, an example of someone who, you know, he was sitting on the plane. This is what he was thinking about. He was presented with an opportunity of chesed and he took advantage of it. Let me tell you another story about a man who was Nifter last year, very famous in the Jewish community in New York. His name was Ronnie Greenwald. You can look him up. He was called the Jewish James Bond. And he was a community activist, an international spy, a political mediator, 
a mentor for troubled teens, and even a beloved camp director of the Camp Camp Sternberg, which actually my daughter uh, went to. And he was a dedicated Jew. Anyways, the stories told about him that he used to frequently go to Lakewood to visit his grandchildren, and he would take the bus. Anyway, one day there was a woman there who had recently become engaged to a, a boy from Lakewood. And it was her first time taking the bus to Lakewood. She was going there to spend Shabbos with her fiance. Anyway, she never had been in the bus station. She hadn't really navigated things there before. And sure enough, she comes to the bus station on Friday and there is a very long lineup to buy tickets. And she's very afraid because she realizes she doesn't know if she's going to get the ticket before the bus leaves, which means, of course, she won't be able to go. So she's standing in line hoping for the best when all of a sudden this Ronnie Greenwald comes over and says to her, do you need a ticket? And she says, yeah. No, he says, are you going to Lakewood? And she said, yes. And she, he says, do you need a ticket? And she said, yes. And he says, here you go. And he gives her a ticket. So she says, wait a second. Uh, how, how do you have an extra ticket? He said, well, I always buy an extra ticket on Friday. And she said, well, what do I owe you? And he says, you don't owe me anything. He said, I do this because I travel to Lakewood. This has happened to me before. And I always like to buy an extra ticket whenever I go on Friday, just in case somebody is not going to make the bus on time. Again, here's a person who thinks, who, who is a master of creating and anticipating an opportunity to do chesed for other people. You know, I always hated those billboards and that expression that was out when my kids were teenagers, do random acts of kindness. I mean, it's a beautiful idea, but in Judaism, we say, don't make them random, make them purposeful. Here's a man who thinks about it, who makes it his specialty to have an extra ticket for Jews in line that are traveling to Lakewood and have to get there before Shabbos. Okay. Um, another story, I, of course, I love to tell, and I think I've told this group before, but that's about last year's Pesach Seder in Lakewood. Again, there was a widow there who couldn't have her family for the Seder, and her next door neighbor say to her, listen, Mrs. Schwartz, why don't you move your table close to your window, your kitchen window, and we're going to move our dining room table close to the window, and this way you'll be able to be at our Seder and we can enjoy it together. And of course, Mrs. Schwartz is thrilled. Of course, it's not the same as having her kids and her family around her, but she's very touched. Anyway, by the end of the Seder, she calls her kids at home and they ask her how it is. And she said it was incredible, but not just that, you wouldn't believe it. They sang all the same tunes that we sing at the Pesach Seder. And they had Minhag and they had customs that we do, that Tati always did, that Daddy did at our Seder. What she didn't know is that this beautiful family next door, the neighbors, had gotten in touch with her kids before Pesach and asked them to tell, teach them the songs, tell them the tunes, the different customs that they do, that they're used to, that their mothers used to, so that they could incorporate it into their Seder. Now, that's what you call chesed with thought, with preparation with a beautiful pink bow on top. So this is the kind of uh, thought that people put into chesed who really understand the mitzvah. The Rambam asks a question. It's a famous question. He says, is it better to give $100 to a needy person or to give $1 to 100 people? Now, all else being equal, that it won't make a big difference to the recipient that they get the $100, okay? The Rambam concludes that it's better for a person to give a dollar to 100 people than to give $100 to one person. And what's the thinking behind it? Because the whole idea of the mitzvahs is to change us. So we can give $100 once to one person, but when we give a dollar 100 times, what that does is make us into a person of chesed. We flex that muscle, right? Just like in the gym, over and over and over again. And the act changes us. 
we become not just somebody who gives tzedakah, but we become characterized by this trait of wanting to give, of wanting to do. You know, so you can get a hundred letters in the mail asking for tzedakah. Instead of giving a thousand dollars to one of them, what the Rambam's telling us is give ten dollars to a hundred different tzedakahs. And that's how you work to flex that muscle and become a Baal tzedakah, a master of tzedakah, but more than that, a person of tzedakah. So who else in the Tanakh is associated with kindness? We get a hint in the Megillah itself. When Boaz meets Rus again at the end of the story, and he hears about the chesed that she's been doing for her mother-in-law, and she has this reputation of chesed, she says, he says to her, I've been fully informed of all that you've done for your mother-in-law, how you left your father and mother and the land of your birth, and you went to a people that you had never known before. So this line in the Megillah is supposed to remind us of somebody else, the beginning of our Jewish history, Avraham. Avraham also, right? In order to become a Jew, he really was the first convert, right? God tells him, leave your home, your birthplace, your country, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Now, the rabbis compare Ruth and Avraham with each other, and the rabbis actually say that Ruth was even greater than Avraham. How so? Avraham was told by God, get up, get out, leave your place, go. I mean, who's going to say no to God? But Ruth, the rabbis tell, tell us, did it without anybody telling her to do it. If anything, it was totally something that was unrealistic. And she picks herself up from Moab. And not only that, she has her mother-in-law telling her three times, this is where we learned the law, one of the laws of conversion, that you're supposed to dissuade somebody three times from becoming a convert. Ruth tries to dissuade her three times. Don't come. What do you want to come with me for? I don't have any more sons for you to marry. You'll be a nobody and a nothing in Israel. Don't come with me. But Ruth persists. And so great is her des desire to join the Jewish people and to live according to the Torah. And of course, the most famous words in the Megillah are said here, where Ruth says to Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. I, your people are my people, and your God is my God. But what do we learn from this? What do we learn about Chesed here, about Rus? Ruth, Ruth understands that to be reborn, to remake oneself, one has to heed an internal call. The internal call to move away from the familiar, to move out of one's comfort zone. And that often chesed goes together with sacrifice. Sacrifice and selflessness are often part and parcel of a chesed person, of someone who personifies chesed. I'll tell you another story that I heard from Rabbi Pesach Krohn. Quick story about a camp in the summer with 400 boys, camp called Camp Romamu. And of course, summertime it, for boys is very difficult, keeping Shabbos from morning till night. They keep them busy, of course, in the morning with davening and eating nice meals, but they have to fill the afternoon with something and there's no ball playing and there's no water sports and there's nothing like that at a kosher uh, Jewish camp. So they came up with a raffle that any boys who learn extra on Shabbos, Mishnayot, they'll be put into this raffle and they can win extra time at the waterfront, right? More water skiing. And I think the second prize was a beautiful watch. Anyway, there were a few boys from Antwerp that had come to the camp that summer. And one of these boys was determined that he's going to win the raffle and get the extra time on the waterfront. So he was learning and learning and learning and getting tickets and tickets and tickets. But, you know, there were 400 boys and they were all doing the same thing. But he'd walk around saying, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. He was so confident. Anyway, when the day came for the raffle, he was in shock because he couldn't believe it. 
as confident as he was, he was still surprised when they literally pulled out his name. Anyway, what he found out later was that all the boys in his unit had decided that since he wanted to win so badly, they would all write his name on their raffle tickets to make sure that he had the best chance possible. Again, that doesn't happen with boys who don't grow up in homes that value chesed, that talk about chesed, where they see their parents involved in chesed. It doesn't just magically happen. It has to already have been a value that they grew up with. I had my own experiences in Israel where I would go to very, very poor families for Shabbos and be treated like royalty. I would see that every kid at the table had a little tiny wing on their plate for Friday night dinner. But me and my friends who were the guests, just like being with Avram Avinu, we'd be served a, a larger piece of chicken. You know, these kids were willing to give up their beds for guests. They would fight over who's going to give up their bed to have the guests sleep in their beds. And this, again, is a home that's permeated with the desire to do chesed and teaching that it's an opportunity. It's a privilege to be able to do such things. So there was a famous rabbi, Rabbi Dessler. He actually died in 1953. He was a scholar and a philosopher and the mashkiach at the Panovich Yeshiva, one of the most Harvard yeshivas of Israel today. And he wrote a book called Strive for Truth. And in volume one of Strive for Truth, he asked the question, does giving, sorry, does love lead to giving or does giving lead to love? And what he thought about was the parent-child relationship. He said, you know, parents love their children so much. And this is a relationship of complete giving. From the moment a child is born, what is the parent doing? Giving, 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 right? Three in the morning, seven in the morning, doesn't matter. You know, I'm giving, that's my job. And there's a reality that they say that a child can never love a parent as much as a parent loves a child. And Rabbi Dester concludes it's because of all the giving that a parent does for a child. And so as much as when we love somebody, we want to give to them, Rabbi Dester decides that it's really giving that leads to loving. And the more you give to others, the more you see yourself in other people, right? And when you meet a stranger, the only reason that he's a stranger is because you haven't yet given to him. Once you give to somebody, even if you're at a bus stop and they ask you directions or which bus they should take and you have a little conversation or you have to give them some information, the distance between you has been, you know, um, shortened. You feel that you are part of that other person just by virtue of giving. In Hebrew, again, the word ahava, which is love, has two little words in the middle, which is hav. And hav in Aramaic means give. It's actually interesting because uh, I think hav is also the way they uh, say they, uh, the barking of a dog in Hebrew. We say woof, woof. They say hav, hav, okay, in Israel, which means give, give, right? Give me some food, right? Whatever, whatever it is the dog wants. Okay, um, but again, when we give to another person, we expand ourselves. We make ourselves bigger. We become limitless, like Hashem, who is the ultimate giver. We, so to speak, move outside of our physicality. Our physicality disappears, and the illusion of seeing ourselves as a separate unit becomes just that, an illusion. And the spiritual truth of the oneness of human beings, and specific, specifically of the Jewish people, becomes reality. You know, it's interesting that before we could receive the Torah, the prerequisite was the unity of the Jewish people. If you look up in the Torah, before the giving of the Torah, you'll see that it says there, sham ahar, that the Jewish people camped in front of the mountain. 
But the rabbis ask the question, what do you mean the Jewish people, Vayichan? Vayichan is singular. You use that for he can't. It should say Vayichanu and they can't. But Rashi says there, no, this is deliberate to tell you that the Jewish people before the giving of the Torah were ke'ishachad belevachad. They were like one person with one heart. So the world our rabbis teach us is actually divided between givers and takers. Giving is the voice of the soul and taking is the voice of the body. I want to tell you a few other stories that talk about, that, that reveal the chesed that the Jewish people are known for. In the Talmud in Yevamos, it actually says um, there that the Jewish peace, per, people personify three attributes. They are, they are Baishanim, Rachmanim, and Gomle Chasadim. What does that mean? They have a sense of shame, of modesty. We get this from Yitzchak Avinu, we're told. They're Rachmanim, they have compassion. We get this from Yaakov, we're told. And they're Gomle Chasadim. They are doers of loving kindness. They love to do good stuff. There's even a saying that it says, if somebody says they're Jewish and they're lacking any of these three mido, you should look into their yichos. You should look into their genealogy and just check. Because if they don't have compassion and love doing good stuff, then I don't know, maybe they're not Jewish. Anyway, let me tell you a star story, another true story that I heard on this uh, website about a Jamaican guy, a non-Jewish guy who drives a truck in Flatbush, okay? Now this non-Jewish Jamaican guy one day was locked out of his truck and he couldn't get in and he couldn't make his deliveries. And all of a sudden he realizes, oh, wait a second. He has this car that this Jewish guy gave him, right? And, and he told him, whenever you're locked out of your car, just call this number. So he pulls out the card and he looks at it and on the top it says Chaverim, which really is Chaverim, right? Which means friends. Anyway, and there's a number there. Anyway, he calls the number and sure enough, these two guys come out of nowhere. You know, they drive up their car. They get into his truck in no time flat and he's able to get in. And as they're leaving, he says, what can I pay you? What do I owe you? And they say, nothing. They owe us nothing. We, we just do this. Anyway, he couldn't believe it. He said, wow, that's incredible. I have to tell you that I actually once had to call them. I was literally locked out of my car on Avenue M in Brooklyn and right across the street from me was a locksmith that was going to charge me hundreds of dollars to get into my car and I didn't know what to do and I figured okay in the meantime I'm going to go buy my fruits and vegetables because that's why I was there to go grocery shopping while I'm picking out my apples I mentioned to somebody next to me I'm locked out of my car I don't know what to do she said don't you know about Javerium I said no I never heard of it she said hold on a second she gave me their number and sure enough, they came with all their gadgets and got into my car, no charge. Anyway, this Jamaican guy stops this rabbi on the street and he says, I don't understand. He says like, like he, he tells him the story about his car and then he says, and I always see these Hatsala trucks driving all over Flatbush and I know they're going to save people. Do they get paid? <laughs> you know? And the rabbi says, no, they don't get paid. You know, and he doesn't even know about the free loan societies. He doesn't know about, you know, um, um, the gemachim, if you guys know about that, how there's all these free things that you can get, you know, in Israel, if you need a crib for your newborn baby, there's someone who has 25 cribs in their house. You know, if you need a bike, there's somebody who's got old bikes that they save so people can come and get them for free. If you even need chickpeas for your uh, Shalom Zahra that's coming up and you had no time to make them, there's somebody in Jerusalem who's making chickpeas for you and they're always there, okay? He doesn't know about all this, but he says to the rabbi after hearing that they don't get any money for any of this, he says, I don't understand. Why does God need any other people in his world? He's got you guys. <laughs> So, you know, we're known to be these kind of people. Now, God himself models chesed for us. The Torah begins and ends with chesed. It's called Torah chesed. The beginning of the Torah, after Adam and Chava sin and are naked, God literally clothes them. At the end of the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu dies, and there's nobody who sees where he dies. 
Nobody to this day knows where he's buried. And the Torah tells us that God himself buries Moshe. Okay. So it's not Torah study, our rabbis teach us, but practice that is the main thing. Be wise, not only in words, but in deeds. Mere knowledge is not the goal, but action. And that's why we have two sides of the lucho, two sides of the tablets. We have one side that represents our mitzvahs between us and Hashem. And we have the other side, which are the mitzvahs between us and other people. And they're both equally weighty. They're both equally balanced because Hashem says to be a complete Jew, you need both. You know, some people are great at one over the other to the exclusion of the other. But in order to be a properly balanced Jew, we have to work on those areas that are not natural to us. You know, I think it was the show Wicked or something I went to once and there was a song there, no good deed goes unpunished. And I think I drove everybody crazy who I was with because I hated that song. And I said, that's not a Jewish idea. What do you mean no good deed goes unpunished? That sounds so negative. Why would anybody want to do a good deed? In Judaism, we say, are you kidding? Every good deed goes with a reward. Isn't that what the book of Ruth teaches us? to teach us the reward for those who do good deeds, who do chesed. Now you might not see the reward in this lifetime. You may not get appreciated or thanks for it, but there is no way that you are going to lose out from doing a chesed. The chesed that we do is never lost. And I'm gonna tell you a story right now, an incredible story that reveals that. So this is a true story that happened a few years ago during the Intifada in Israel. This IDF soldier had been shot outside of Ramallah and the Arab who had shot him took him for dead and left him there by the side of the road. Meanwhile, he was still alive, but he was bleeding. And another fellow, this guy named Shlomo Bergman drives by and he sees Gadi bleeding by the side of the road, throws him into his car and rushes him to the hospital. So basically it's touch and go there in the hospital, but he sees that the doctors have things under control. Gutty's life is gonna be saved and he leaves the hospital. Moments before his parents find out where their son is and come rushing into the hospital to see him there. Anyway, after some time, a few weeks, Gutty returns to Ashdod where he lives. And his mother's very bothered because she wants to find the boy who saved her son's life. So she makes a bunch of phone calls, but she doesn't get anywhere. And she starts putting up signs all over Ashdod and neighboring villages um, by Ashdod. And she actually also owns the local grocery store in Ashdod. So she puts up a few posters there. Meanwhile, um, this boy, uh, Shlomo's parents, uh, about two years later, I think, or maybe a year later, his mother is visiting Ashdod. She used to live there. And she's visiting a friend there in Ashdod. And, you know, she sees the signs here and there, but she it isn't until she goes into the grocery store and she sees the signs and she sees the woman behind the counter and she's in shock. And she says to the woman behind the counter, she says, um, you know, uh, don't you remember me? Don't you remember me? I'm Mrs. Bergman. And, you know, Mrs. Ramon, Gadi's mother, stares at her and says, I don't remember you. And she says, well, I'll never forget you because 22 years ago, we were living in Ashdod with two kids. And I came into your store one day and I was crying. You see, I was pregnant. And I just had a conversation with my doctor about aborting this baby because my husband and I were under incredible economic pressure and we couldn't imagine having and bringing another child into the world in the situation that we were in. She said, well, you noticed me crying and you and your husband sat down with me and my husband actually, and you, overheard our conversation and you sat down and you gave us advice and financial planning. And because of you, I decided not to have the abortion. 
And then they hugged each other. And Mrs. Bergman said, the poster is my son. It's describing my son. Because you saved my son's life 22 years ago, my son ended up saving your son's life. In Hebrew, we see that the words venathnu are a palindrome and they get and they give. Doesn't matter how you read it, right or left, it says the same thing because when a person does chesed, it can literally save somebody's life. We never know how it's going to come back to us. Okay, I want to end with the last question, which is the Talmud asks, what is greater, chesed or tzedakah? Which one is greater? And the Talmud concludes that chesed is greater than tzedakah for three reasons. Now, tzedakah, when we're talking about tzedakah, we're talking about, you know, money, being able to help somebody with your money. So why is chesed greater than tzedakah? So number one, chesed is something you can do for the rich or the poor. The rich don't need your money, but they might need you to visit them when they're sick. They might need you to pay them a shiva call or dance at their children's wedding and make their children happy. Okay? Chesed is something that can be done with money. You can certainly use money and buy a ticket for that lady that's standing on the online. But it can also be done with your body, right? Very often, and a lot of the writings about tzedakah talk about how, you know, when somebody knocks on your door and is asking you for money, it's not the amount of money that really matters, right? If you give them $5 or $50, what really matters to this person is that you listen to their story that you invite them in and maybe give them a glass of orange juice, that you sit down for a few minutes with them. And I, I was once a bus by it at someone's house. When somebody knocked on his door, he like brought him in, sat him down at his dining room table. It was as if he was meeting with the biggest CEO of, a, of an organization, okay? And all the poor person, what the poor person or the person with Suris wants more than anything else is to unburden their soul. So when you give them five or 10 minutes of your time to say, gee whiz, I'm really sorry. I see you lost your wife. Your wife is sick. None of your kids are married. You know, you're having a hard time. This means much more to them that you've done this with your body than the five bucks or the 50 bucks or the hundred bucks that you give them. They'll remember that. Okay. And the last thing is chesed can be done for the dead or for the living, right? We have a famous saying that when a person does the mitzvah of burying another person, of levayat hamet, of accompanying the dead, he's doing a chesed shel emet. He's doing a true chesed because that person can never do anything back for him. So often when we do chesed, we're, 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 we're tallying things up, right? I did this for you. I'm expecting for you to be back there for me. If I do this for you, I want you to do this for me. And that's not a friendship. That's called a business relationship. But, you know, that's a lot of times what motivates us or what we have in the back of our mind. But when it comes to the dead, they're not going to do anything back for you. So God knows this is a chesed shel emes. You know, this is the most altruistic a human being can be. And I want to end with an incredible story that just happened. It's a true story that was told of the Shiva of... Um, a man who unfortunately died in Moran recently, the 45 that died, his name was Elazar Yitzchak ben, Re ben Reuven. His neshama should have an aliyah. And this was told at his shiva. There was a boy who during the time when everybody was trampled was literally lying on top of this, this young man who died. And he said he heard him saying Shema Yisroel because he knew it was his life was near the end. But he said, but after he finished saying Shema Yisrael, he whispered in the ear of this man who was on top of him, whoever is on top of me, I am moichel you. I forgive you. These were his last words. 
Now, what do we learn from this? First of all, we learned that this was not a simple person. And probably all of those 45 that died in the way they did at this moment of being in the most ecstatic, holy place and singing Animamin and Shema Yisro and everything else that happened before their deaths, none of them were simple people. But we get a glimpse into the specialness of this person. This was a person whose primary thought before dying was to be concerned for other for another person's possible feelings of guilt and regret. Only a person who lives for others during their life would think like this in his last dying moments. He's worried about this poor guy who may survive living a life thinking I killed him. It was my fault if I hadn't been there, whatever, any kind of remorse like that at all, he did not want him to suffer. So what can we learn from this? Another thing we can learn is to consider the feelings of others, even when we're, we ourselves are in a difficult situation. Rav Chaim Velazhin said, the great Rosh Hashiva of pre-war Europe, a man was born for others not to serve himself. I just want to end with this beautiful idea that I always love, which is from the Talmud Sanhedrin 20a. And it's talking about uh, references to Aishas Chayel and what the woman of valor means. And it's interesting because it says, he who fears the Lord, she, uh, sorry, whoever fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And in the Talmud, it says, this is a reference to the generation of Rabbi Yehuda, son of Rabbi Eli, who lived after the decrees of Hadrian, when the people were impoverished and oppressed. It was said about Rabbi Yehuda, son of Rabbi Eli, that six of his students would cover themselves with one garment due to their poverty. And nevertheless, they would engage in Torah study. So the famous Rosh Hashiva of the Mir, Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz asked the question, he says, how do six people share one garment? And he says, you know how six people share one garment? The only way it's possible, imagine a blanket, ladies. The only way it's possible for six people to get under one blanket is if every person is trying to cover the other person next to them. If every person is pushing the blanket to make sure it's on top of the other person. He says, when everybody's doing that, instead of each one pulling it, right? Hey, I'm cold. Hey, give me the blanket. Hey, cover me. He said, that's the only way it's possible. That's the only way it's possible for six people to share one garment and engage in Torah study at the same time. Okay. So Back to our question, our original question, why do we read Ruth on Shavuot? And the answer, as the rabbi said, is to teach us the reward for deeds of loving kindness. The chesed that Ruth did, her reward was to become part of the Jewish people, but more so to become the progenitor of King David, who will eventually lead to the ultimate redeemer, the ultimate King of Israel, right? Mashiach himself. Selflessness and kindness are the keys to spiritual growth. We want to be ruthful, not ruthless. And we've got six days where we can incorporate chesed into our day. Rabbi Avigdor Miller, Zetzal, said, if you want to become great, do a kindness for someone every day. And even better, don't let them know about it. Smile in the street, even if it's behind your mask, you can still practice, right? <laughs> Do for others outside your family. Give somebody a call who's all alone. Do something for somebody inside your family. That's even harder sometimes, <laughs> right? Especially when we've been living in such close quarters. Make a phone call, check in with somebody. Make doing a chesed part of your daily regimen. Who have I done something for today? How can I move outside myself, make myself bigger, make myself part of the world out there, 
of the oneness of the world. So Ruth showed us the way. Let's follow in her footsteps that lead to Kabbalah HaTorah and not just do chesed, random acts of chesed, but do purposeful acts of chesed and become a personality of chesed. The more we exercise that muscle, the more we recreate and redefine who we are and who we want to be. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Any questions, comments?